So in the second part of this unit, we are going to work at finding the minimum of a function. So um, the module we're going to use is scipy.optimize, and it has uh, several functions that can find the minimum value of a function. Uh, one I'm going to show you today is fmin. Uh, this is almost certainly the most basic. It's one of the oldest functions in the package. Um, uh, but it's uh, good at a, sit at a very simple situation. So what we do is we're going to give it the function we're trying to find the minimum of. I'm going to give it a starting value of the independent variable, a starting x. And it will go around and it will go and try and find uh, the minimum. OK, so we import um, SciPy, import fmin from scipy optimize. Um, and uh, here we're going to have an example of calling it with our quadratic function that we defined previously. So I go and pass it um, in the name of the function. So note that what I'm passing in there is not a call to the function. There are no brackets after quadratic. And it's not a string. There are no quotes around quadratic. It is the function identifier. Uh, and this comes back to an idea um, that in Python, you can think of a function as being a bit like a variable with a type function. So a variable which has a particular type when the type is function. And the value of that variable is the code that you should execute in order to run the function. Um, and so the name of the function becomes just like any other variable name. Um, so um, in this case here, our function was quadratic. So I'm just passing it quadratic as the, as the variable name. And then the next thing I give it is the starting value for x. And I say, well, start at x equals 0. And then we also need to tell fmin, well, how are you going to call this function? So we have to pass it the other arguments that go into that function. And again, I've previously I've defined a, b, and c um, in the previous part of this tutorial. So I can just pass it um, via this args keyword parameter. I pass it a tuple, um, uh, so in other words, a sequence of the other arguments that it needs in order to go and call that function. So fmin will know that this quadratic function is going to take an x value and then everything else that we've given it as the in the args keyword. And so it goes away and does it. Uh, and then by default, it prints out a little message. So it tells me that it um, did manage to optimize the function, meaning it found a minimum. Um, and it tells me that it found a minimum at uh, f of x is equal to minus 1. So um, that's the y value where our minimum is. It told me it took 27 iterations. So it, what it did is it, and during this time it evaluated the function 54 times. So what it's done is it's evaluated um, the function um, on either side of the guess I gave it. It's worked out which way the function is sloping downhill. It's moved a bit in that direction. It's again evaluated a couple of times, um, worked out downhill. It's kept on sort of following itself around the function till it locates the minimum um, and steps in. And I'll show you in a second about, you can actually see the sort of what is going on as it does that. And then what it returns is an array of one element, uh, which is the location of the minimum. And you can see in this case, it has indeed found that the minimum is at two, which is what we were expecting. Um, and it's um, kept on going, getting trying to get it more and more accurately as to what that value is um, until it's able to give us a very precise value. And in fact, it tells us that it is exactly 2.0. So one of the limitations, and our, our sort of first limitation of fmin that we need to look at is that it can be fooled if the function has more than one minimum. So let's look at an example of a function where that's true. So we're going to look at a function called the Landau energy function. This is used in the thermodynamics of phase transitions. What it basically says is that the free energy of a transition um, is dependent on some parameter. Um, uh, there are many things it could be. Um, uh, yeah. Things like uh, a magnetization, a temperature, and electric polarization, um, all kinds of all kinds of things, uh, and then uh, two parameters, alpha and beta, and it's expressed as a term which goes as x squared and a term which goes as x to the four. And if alpha is negative and beta is positive, 
then the function can end up having two minima. So if I was to go and define that uh, in a similar way to we defined it for the quadratic, I'd write a function like this. So you can see I've got the independent variable first, and then I've got the alpha and the beta, and the actual function itself is quite trivial. Now, I want to show you how SciPy optimizes actually working, what it's actually going to do. So I'm going to write a slightly more complicated version of that function. I'm going to add another parameter called track. Um, and uh, that's going to be a keyword parameter as a default value of none. But if track is not none uh, and instead is the um, some axes of a plot, it will go and add to that plot a point showing um, uh, where it is. Um, and so in order to go and do that, uh, you see I've just added this if statement and I'm calling another function called plot track, which I'll uh, define in just a second, um, that will go and um, do the business of actually showing that plot. So this lambda function I've written here, it's got this extra parameter, but that's just to do with showing you what's going on as I call the function. Um, all I actually needed to make it work was the previous version. Um, okay, so as I said, to go and show you what's going on here, I've added this extra parameter and I've gone to have this extra function. So this track plot, sorry, plot track function is a bit complicated. It's doing a whole bunch of stuff that um, in matplotlib that you don't need to know for computing to as a module, but I've included it in the notebook so you can try running it yourself to see what happens. Um, and to show you what the effect is then, we can um, start off with our uh, Landau plot. So here's just going to convince you that this function does have two minima. Um, so it looks like this, sort of a W shape. And now we can go and call fmin on it. Um, and we're going to start um, like this. So we'll start by telling it to um, look for um, a value that's um, just ever so slightly positive away from zero. Um, and what you can see here is the red is how it's gone and called um, the Landau function as it was working out where the minimum was. And what you can see is that starting from the origin or close to the origin, it's taken a whole series of small steps forward um, in positive, gradually the steps get bigger and bigger, and it sort of slides into the minimum. Um, and then at some point, just after x is equal to two, it takes a big step forward and it ends up at the other side of the minimum. Uh, X is equal to four point something, a very, very positive value. And so it says, oh, no, hang on, I've gone too far. I need to step back. So then it steps back a little bit and it goes back down uh, close to the minimum. And it says, OK, let's step forward again. Uh, so it steps forward, it goes, OK, that's gone up. And it's sort of bouncing around inside that minimum, gradually uh, working its way um, into into the minimum value and you see eventually it comes back and it says it's found a minimum at uh, 3.16 uh, and a bit um, and if we look at the um the report that it's telling us it had 29 iterations 58 function calls um, in order to go and do that So what we see is that, um, as I said, that X has started off at zero and we've ended up in the positive minimum. Um, but the first problem is we've only found one of these minima. Um, the function has another minima. Um, so in order to find the other one, we'd have to repeat, but with a different starting point so that it walks into the, the minimum in the other direction. And then to be sure we found all the minimum, we'd need to take lots of different starting points um, and then we have to go and do some, um, or else we'd have to do some way of figuring out some clever guesses of where to start. So the next problem is that um, we could end up bouncing right out of the minimum where we were expected to get. So you saw we took a big step in the in the previous example, and we'd end up um, uh, a long way. So. Um, to show you a, an, an example of where this could be a problem, the sort of situations where this happens, I'm going to find another function. So I've called this not Landau, um, and it's a function that's deliberately designed to be a pretty badly behaved for trying to find minima. So when I plot it, you see I've plotted and it looks like this. It has two minima, and it has some massive great spike at x equals zero, and away from x, it's very, very flat. 
Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to try and use that to uh, find a minimum. And so what I've done here is I've started off and I've my initial guess, I said I've just made it five. So I've started well over on the right hand side. And I've done this in order to go and illustrate the one of the limitations of how fmin works. So you see what happens here is it takes lots of steps. Um, it works out it needs to walk towards zero and not uh, any further away from zero. And it sort of takes steps. And every time it takes a step, the value of the function isn't changing very much. And so it takes a bigger and bigger and bigger steps each time. And the problem then is that as it gets close to where the minima are, it ends up taking such a big step, it jumps into x as negative. And after that, it'll start converging in on the negative minimum. So although I started at positive x, it's actually found the, the minimum at negative x. So it's missed out the one, the minimum at positive x altogether. Um, and so that obviously is, is a little bit unexpected and could potentially be a problem. The important thing to appreciate with all of these things is these scipy functions are not magic. And the better you can give them a guess as to where to start looking for things, the better they're going to behave. So the problem we had in our previous example was our guess was crap. And because it was useless, we didn't manage to go and find uh, the minimum we were hoping to go and find. Uh, and so there's kind of a related problem, and that is that if your function has lots of minima, how do you end up knowing you've located the, the lowest one? So um, this is a problem of how do you identify whether you found the global minimum as opposed to a local minimum? Fmin is very good at finding you the local minimum. It'll find the nearest minimum in whatever in the function you're looking at, depending where you start. But how do you know that's the lowest possible one? So um, let's look at modifying our Landau function by adding a linear term to it. So again, I've just written a very similar uh, function. Um, I've again done this thing where I'm putting in this extra track parameter to let us go and plot um, where we're going. But uh, inside that function, the important thing is I call um, the Landau function, I add this plus five times x uh, term into it to make a linear offset. So when I plot that, you can see it looks like this. So there is a, the minimum negative x is much lower than the minimum positive x. So, okay, the function has two minimum, um, and one's much lower than the other. Um, and so if we start it off again, what you can see if we did repeat what we did previously, maybe unsurprisingly, it ends up in the positive minimum. So although the one at negative x is lower, because it started at positive x, it falls into the one at positive x. And so it misses out the genuinely the lowest value of that function. So well, what you can do, um, you could just evaluate with lots and try lots and lots of different um, values of x and, and find out all the minima in the function and then work out uh, which one's lowest. Um, and you could sort of do that by brute force. But SciPy Optimize has many different algorithms it can use to, um, to, to allow um, this to happen. Um, and um, in particular, the one I want to talk about is differential evolution. So differential evolution is a class of algorithms known as gen genetic algorithms. And the idea here is that you calculate results with a whole range of different possible parameters, or in this case, trial solutions. So uh, in other words, you choose a whole different set of um, values of X. You then pick the ones that seem to be best. And then you use the values of X that they were calculated with to give you a whole new set of uh, potentially trial values of x um, and um, try again and pick the best ones that worked and again use that to go and um, give you a new set of values of x that are based on those the, the best values you had previously and repeat and repeat and repeat and eventually you should end up finding the best possible values of x. The clever thing is that just as with natural evolution you also allow for trying out some things which look like they shouldn't be anywhere close to being the best optimal solution. So in other words, you allow for some mutant values of X in your 
um, calculation just in case they happen to be miraculously a lot better than the ones you thought you were going into. And what that means is that the algorithm doesn't get stuck just in local minimum. It's got a chance of getting out and finding that you know, there's another set of X values that give you an even better solution. And so we can show this um, by importing differential evolution. It works very similarly to fmin. Um, and here you can see it's bouncing around. It locates that, yes, there is a minimum of positive X, but then you can also see it rather quickly works out um, that, in fact, there's a whole bunch more solutions at negative X. And so what it gets then is the, the negative X um, solution. Now, the problem with this is that um, it ended up having to call our function many, many times more. Um, and so the, um, the, the, the problem with differential evolution functions is that if your function that describes your physics is slow and you end up calling it many, 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 many times, your overall solution finding the optimum values is also very, very slow. So um, differential evolution, again, none of these things are magic. They all have their pros and their cons, and you need to think about exactly how your, your um, situation is going to work out to decide what's best. Um, and so as with a lot of these things, the most important thing you need to do is to understand what it is that the equation you're working with are really going to go and mean and kind of how the physics actually works.